When we have our heart's desire and focus on it, to bring it to fruition, and you're talking about everything being an escrow, how does universe line things up? And is there a predetermined course? How does the lining things up work when everyone has free will? Oh, I think you're really going to enjoy this because the lining up is so huge and there are so many options that it would be like you being a child or, or an adult and saying to someone, I'm hungry and 5,000 complete meals appearing before you instantaneously. In other words, that's a sort that sort of gives you some sense of relationship to how fast it is and how many options there are. And this is our way of saying to you that it's not a straight and narrow path that you must make your way to. In other words, when you achieve vibrational alignment with your well-being, around every corner is a potential satisfying of something that you want, literally. And the reason that the universe is able to do that is because there are so many players. There is so much data. There is so much interaction. There has been so much already expansion. In other words, the ingredients are already here. And so it is another way we like to say it is when you ask for something, say you're asking for a relationship immediately, at least a hundred avenues to lead you directly to what your heart's desire would feel satisfied having are before you instantly, at least a hundred options. But if you're not in vibrational alignment with them, there might not, there might, might as well not be any. In other words, it, it's like, it's like your friend saying, Oh, I heard the most beautiful music being played from my radio all morning long. I had my radio dial set on 98.6 and it was rapturous. And you said, I didn't hear it. Did you have your radio dial set on 98.6? No. So if you're tuned up, if you're in alignment with what you want, then it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. It's about vibrational alignment. So your question is, how does the universe do this? Is it already there? It's not a matter of some kind of magic happening and it lines up and appears or everything is already present. It's just a matter of us vibrationally matching to what is already present. By the time you were able to identify it in thought as a desire, it's done. If you can think it, the components are here and you can realize it as quickly as you line up with them. How does free will affect that when other people are involved and they have choices and they're making choices out of their fears and false beliefs? Well, when you interject what you think they think into your vibration, your vibration comes becomes cluttered. In other words, when it, if you say, I want the, I want a prize. The universe says, very well, we will line up endless opportunities for you to have your prize. And when you say, but there is only one prize, the universe says, very well, we will make it very difficult for you. <laughs> and when you say there is only one prize and I think that person will get it, the universe says, very well, it will not be yours. Your thoughts happen. But when you say, there is no shortage of prizes. The universe says, then pluck from those that please you. They are everywhere around you. When you say, but I am the only worthy one and no one else is worthy. The universe says, well, depends upon how they feel about them, not how you feel about them. In other words, um, your every thought affects your vibration, but that's all that affects your vibration. And your vibration is the only thing that ever affects your outcome. I think a long time ago on one of the tapes I heard, uh, it was a great word picture for me about, it's like the Maytag repairman is sitting up there on the other side, drumming his fingers, just hoping and waiting for us to turn something over and allow it universe to line things up and make them happen. Well, the so. universe is not ever feeling impatience on your behalf or boredom. In other words, because every time you launch a preference, the universe has gone to work on fulfilling your preference and has taken great satisfaction in doing so. In other words, all of your future worlds have been envisioned and enjoyed by all that is non-physical. That's why it's in escrow ready for you to let it into your experience. Just Wayne Dyer's book says, you will see it when you believe it. And we say to you, test the heck out of it. 
In other words, make yourself believe it. Show yourself. Think thoughts and watch them manifest. Think other thoughts. In other words, notice the correlation between what you think and feel and what happens. It's accurate every single time. Adjust the way you feel. Watch what happens. It's accurate every single time. But what's tricky about this is, and we keep coming back around to this here today, it's wonderful awareness, is that if I stand here and I want to be over there and I say I'm willing to do anything it takes to get over there, I've got a resistance within my vibration because of my inherent dissatisfaction with where I am. Where if I say it's lovely over here and it would be lovely over there, now I've softened that resistance. As I say, from my lovely vantage point where I feel blessed and worthy, I'm looking forward to more evidence of my blessedness and worthiness. Now you've got the whole gamut covered. In other words, can you feel how, how that just cleaned everything up, you see? But as you play with each other and you feel competition and you worry about how much abundance there is, Esther has been <laughs> enjoying coming to the realization that there is not a shortage of anything. And she has that just about figured out with re relative to everything except shortage of time. Or she will say, it feels to me like there's a shortage of Esther. In other words, there's not enough of Esther to go all of the places that everybody would like Esther would to be. Um, people will call and say, please, a telephone consultation. And Esther will say, well, we haven't done that in a long time. We just ran out of time. And they will say, just one, please, just one. And Esther said, well, I, that's how I got myself into that bind to begin with. In other words, just one more, just one more, just one more, just one more. And then we explain to Jerry and Esther that when you are thinking about budgeting your dollars, you have flexibility in the sense that you can... Pay attention to the way the dollars are flowing out and you have some measure of control, but you can also open the vortex through which the dollars come in and then you have an even broader measure of control. So when you realize that you're tapped into the abundance of dollars or to the abundance of abundance, then you don't have to worry about shortage because it flows in as fast as it flows out. But then Esther said, but what about time? It seems like time can't expand like dollars. She said, I can see how my my dollars could expand so that I don't feel shortage as I'm expending. But with time, we all only have the same 24 hours in a day. And if we only have this, so all I can do is be responsible about the way I spend that time because if I spend it over here I don't have it to spend over there and we say but when you are determined to feel joy in any moment that you are spending it then in the same way that you have taken dollars out of the equation now you have taken time out of the equation and when you take things like dollars and time out of the equation then you begin to take shortage out of the equation then you begin to take limitation out of the equation then you begin to expect Somehow, some way, whatever you want to manifest. And that's when the distance between your dream and the realization of it becomes infin infinitesimal. And that's when you say, well, it's like magic. And we say, it isn't magic. It's normal. Because I think many of us have all our desires and it, we can see them orbiting around us. And there's sort of a force field between us and it that keeps it away. And I think it's what you were just saying. Well, when is, you as think you... about it, you're not wanting to eat all of your food now. You want to eat some now and savor. And, all the... and you're not wanting to have all of your orgasms now. You're not, <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not wanting to have all of the delicious experience of life now. You're, wa you're wanting a steady stream of it flowing into your experience. And so those things that are orbiting around, that's like, that's like circling the city looking for a place to eat and feeling frustrated about all the places you're not eating. You don't do that. You just stop and eat someplace. And the same thing is true of all of these desires. You don't have time to contemplate them all at once or to experience them all at once. In other words, whatever you're doing, if what you're doing feels good while you're doing it, then what possible difference does it make about all of the things you're not doing? See, and once you sort of get that, once you start savoring whatever is happening now and no longer are worrying about the things that you're not able to do now, then you get it. Sometimes we know if you're doing something you don't want to do, 
and then you say, well, I'd rather do that, that's where that thinking comes from. But when you've trained yourself to make the best of whatever it is that you are doing, then that gap closes. And then you just go from this fun thing to this fun thing to this satisfying thing to this interesting thing to this provocative thing to this good feeling to this good tasting to this good feeling to this good tasting to this interesting thing. You just move from subject to subject feeling good all the time. And somebody watching you would say, my goodness, how how is it that you have such a broad spectrum of life? And you say, well, I just dabble in all of the good stuff of life. And in time, you will not be able to remember ever doing something that you didn't really enjoy doing. Esther will say, the only thing that ever bothers me is the stuff I can't get to. And we say, now that is shortage consciousness. Because what that saying is, there's not enough of me to go around or there's not enough time for me to do it all. And that's shooting yourself in the foot. Because when you're in that vibration, then whatever you're doing can't be pleasurable either, you see. When you finally start saying things to yourself like, I can't get it all done, I'll never get it all created, I will never get it all achieved, and I wasn't supposed to do that anyway, my mission as a creator is to let the juices flow through me and to enjoy the thrill of the feeling of the juices flowing through me. And sure, they're going to cause creation. Sure, they're going to cause expansion. Sure, things are going to move. Sure, things are going to change. Sure, the world is going to get better and I'm going to have a better life. But that's not the reason I'm doing them. The reason my object of attention exist at all is because as I hold my object of attention, I have the opportunity to feel good as creative juices flow through me in the creation process, the creation process, the eternal process of creation. So how do I find my balance in it? Well, I just listen to Magellan and I reach for what feels good and I can feel when I'm on my path. And when I doesn't feel so good, I, I veer to where it feels better. And when it doesn't feel so good, I veer toward where it feels better. In other words, I just keep reaching for the thoughts and ideas that feel good. And when I find one that feels good, I just milk it. I tell everyone about it. I roll it over and over and over in my mind until I achieve enough vibrational harmony with it that law of attraction brings me other thoughts like it. Think that what happens to so many of you is that somewhere along your path, someone has convinced you that you are unworthy on your way to worthiness and that's a hurdle you can't get over you cannot you cannot jump that hurdle when you say I'm unworthy that's like saying I'm on 98.6 seeking 101 FM you cannot get there from there so you say well how do I get there we say you got to try to feel worthy I can't feel worthy I felt unworthy for so long we say all right then try feeling happy no I can't feel happy I feel too unworthy to feel happy is it, then, then try feeling interested in something. Oh, yeah, I could feel interested. I could feel interested. This is interesting. I feel unworthy about it, though. <laughs> in other words, you just keep reaching. You just keep reaching for. And the the operative word is reaching for the feeling of relief. So we meet someone like you, and we are exaggerating this way out of proportion to the vibration that you are presenting to us here. But we want to say to you. Even someone like you, who has left so much negative emotion behind, who is predominantly in a place of feeling good, even you can continue to find dramatic feelings of relief in your... Sometimes my bridge is just even, thank you for everything in my life, whether I understand it or not. Because I, if I start getting into trying to understand it all, that takes me down that path and just... Just even saying that. Well, we like hearing that from you because that is essentially what we're wanting to say to all of you. You don't have to explain anything to anyone and you don't have to document your trek on your way to worthiness. No one is asking for that explanation except people that aren't in alignment with well-being. When they're not in alignment, there's nothing that you could do to document it that would make them hear it anyway, you see. <laughs> So finally, you just got to say, it only matters how I feel. It only matters what I think and how I feel. And everybody else is just going to have to take care of themselves. There are so many people that, without even knowing they're doing it, will work a guilt trip on you because they think that you could do something that would make them feel better. And they want to feel better. And so we think that the heart of the unworthiness, and it may seem odd that we keep bringing it up, but it's so rampant in your vibrations, that the heart of the unworthiness that most of you are feeling is that you've been unsuccessful in helping someone else feel better. Could you say that again? It's never been, it has never been your job to fix anything in anyone else's experience. It's never been your job. But many of them who want to feel better hold you responsible for them not feeling better. 
And then when you can't do enough for them to make them feel better, then they don't feel better. And then you feel like the thing that mattered to you most you failed about. And that is what is at the heart of most of your unworthiness. Where if you would say, oh, you're getting that, aren't you? Where if you would say once and for all, my happiness is my job and your happiness is your job and then work to maintain your happiness, then you've got it. You see.